Good morning, everyone. Um, the reading this morning is Revelation 14, page 1234. Sorry, 1243. That's Revelation 14, page 1243. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as fruit first to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great which has made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into a cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice say, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them i looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who has seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, last, because with God's wrath is completed. And I, say what, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Kings of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. 
for your righteous acts have been revealed. These are the words of our Lord. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Uh, let's pray uh, before we begin. Thank you, Father, for your word to us. Please help us this morning as we dig into it together to listen and pay careful attention to what you have to say. Amen. So here we are. Uh, welcome to part three of our series in Revelation. Revelation is about the war for the world's worship and the victory of Jesus Christ in that war. The question this week is, how will that war be won? How will the war end? How will it finally be won? We are on the front lines of that war. As Christians, according to Revelation, we are soldiers in the fight. So the question, how will the war be won, is really important for us. If you were a soldier in the trenches in the First World War, or if you are a Ukrainian fighting for your homeland, you are asking this question, how will the war be won? How will it end? Christians likewise ask, how will the war for the world's worship end? Back in chapter 12, we saw that Satan lost the battle in heaven. The dragon was thrown down to earth. He was utterly defeated. He lost. But that didn't mean that the war was over. Satan lost in heaven, but full of rage, he goes off to make war against the church. He opens up a new frontier, if you like, a new battleground. He takes the fight to earth. So there's victory in heaven, but war on earth. Chapter 12, verse 12 said, Rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. Satan lost. Satan is angry. Victory in heaven, war on earth. And then last week, we were thinking about knowing our enemy. We saw how Satan wages war on earth, his tactics. His goal is to steal worship away from the Lord Jesus. And he does this through the work of the beasts that we met in chapter 13. Uh, there was a counterfeit call to worship, to worship counterfeit gods, even a counterfeit son of man. These beasts, they use persecution, coercion, deception, and false religion to steal worship away from Jesus Christ and direct it elsewhere. And honestly, chapter 13 was quite scary, uh, quite a scary chapter. Uh, we read that anyone who refuses to worship the beast gets killed. Uh, we read about everyone receiving a mark on their foreheads without which you cannot buy or sell. Uh, it looks in chapter 13 like the whole world has gone after the beast and is worshipping him. But this week, the lamb fights back. Victory in heaven becomes victory on earth as well. The lamb fights back. We meet his army bracing for battle. We read about the victory being broadcast across the earth as the eternal gospel is proclaimed. We see the harvest of the earth, God's great judgment, as he gathers in his worshippers and punishes the beast and her allies. And then we see the victorious army singing their victory song. Now at the very beginning of Revelation, there's a repeated phrase that Jesus says to the churches. He says, to the one who is victorious. This army that we meet today is a victorious army. Jesus wants his people to be victorious. But what does that mean? What does it mean to live victoriously as a Christian? Uh, sounds great, doesn't it? Doesn't, it doesn't mean uh, living a life of health and wealth and prosperity. It just can't mean that. It doesn't square with anything that Jesus actually says in this book. But what does it then mean to live victoriously? Does it just mean to endure, to grit your teeth, to persevere, and make it to the end? Certainly there's a lot in Revelation about enduring, but there is more to victory than that. The army at the end of our reading are singing a victory song. They are surely an example to John's readers and to us 
They are victorious over the beast, the beast of chapter 13. Christians live victorious lives. The question is how? What does it mean? What does it look like? This will be a big shift for us, I think, in our thinking. Do you think of yourself as a victorious warrior in the Lamb's army? Revelation says you should. That is who we are, who we can be, if we will listen to Jesus' words. So let's dive in. How does the war end? How is it won? First point, the Lamb's army, the Lamb's army, brace for battle. The Lamb's army, brace for battle. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. The 144,000. It's, uh, it's not a literal number like 666 last week. It's symbolic. Uh, why this number, though? Well, we've seen this group of people before in Revelation. So if you don't mind, just keep a finger in chapter 14 and flick back to chapter 7 on page 1238. Page 1238, chapter 7, and verse 3 says, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I heard the number of those were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So here we have 144,000, they come from 12 tribes. Israel had 12 tribes in the Old Testament. So 12, it represents all of God's people. Each tribe in the list has 12,000 people in. 12 for fullness or completeness times 1,000, which is a lot. Uh, each tribe is full. 12 tribes, 12,000 people in each tribe, 144,000 in this army. Why do I say an army? Well, because chapter 7 is an army roll call. If you ever read the book of Numbers, uh, it's full of these lists of numbers, surprise, surprise, full of army roll calls as Israel would uh, count their army before they went out to battle. Revelation 7 sounds like it is straight out of the book of Numbers, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, and so on. This is an army roll call, an army that is measured and counted. And this army is ready for battle. Back in chapter 14 now, and verse 4. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. What's going on there? Well, another picture from the Old Testament. If you were in the army, uh, if you were in the army in Israel, um, one of the things you were supposed to do when you were preparing to go to war um, is you were supposed to abstain from sex. You weren't supposed to sleep with your wife in the build-up to battle. You had to abstain for a certain period. That's just what they had to do in the Old Testament. It's quite a famous example of this, isn't there? Remember the story of David and Bathsheba? And David has his uh, adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and she becomes pregnant. And so what David does is he calls her husband home from the army in the hope that he will sleep with his wife and uh, cover up David's sin that the baby might plausibly be his. But Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, he doesn't sleep with his wife because he knows he's not supposed to. So this army uh, is pure, super pure. It's a typical army, the ideal army. They are numbered, they are pure, they are ready for battle. 
except they're not a typical army at all, are they? They do strange things. They fight in a strange way. They've got unusual battle tactics. Firstly, they sing. Uh, It says that they sing a new song that no one else can learn the words to. Uh, The point is that they are a worshipping army. They give glory not to the beast, but to the Lord, the God of heaven. In verse 3, it says, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. That takes us back to an incredible scene in chapter 4, where John saw the Lord God sitting on the throne of heaven and receiving worship. He is the one true God. This army take part in true worship of the one true God, not the beast. They're a worshipping army. They sing praise to the God of heaven. Another surprise, they don't follow a commander, verse 4. They follow a lamb. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Where does a lamb go? A lamb goes to be slaughtered, to be killed. They are a singing army who keep being killed. They're not a typical army at all. And lastly, verse 5. They're an army that doesn't lie. They're an army who tell the truth. They testify that the Lord is God, that he has the throne and the power and the authority. They give glory to him, not the dragon, not the beast. They don't lie. These are their battle tactics. Worship the Lord alone, follow Jesus even to death, and tell the truth that he is Lord, not the beast. So when you look in the mirror... Uh, with your revelation goggles on, what do you see? A soldier in the Lamb's army, sealed, purified, ready for battle, ready to tell the truth about Jesus. The Lamb's army braces for battle. Secondly, the gospel is proclaimed. I'll read again from verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Isn't the content of this gospel message surprising? We tend to think that the word gospel means good news, but good news is quite a broad term, isn't it? Good news is a promotion at work or some test results coming back with an A star or whatever it is you were hoping for. But gospel good news is much bigger. Gospel good news is regime change. Our enemies are defeated. A new king reigns. It's that kind of good news. News of victory, freedom, liberation. That's gospel good news. And Revelation 14 is exactly that kind of gospel. The hour of God's judgment has come. So now then is the time when the rulers of the world will be overthrown and God will reign. So fear him, worship him, the one who made the heavens and the earth. Give him glory for the hour has come. That's the gospel that is announced. The Lord God has come to reign. Worship him. Part of this gospel good news, a necessary part, is that Babylon gets thrown down. If God is to reign, then all pretenders or rivals must be defeated. The dragon and his beasts, they can't be allowed to run around forever. They need to be taken down, and that's what happens to Babylon, verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Babylon. Babylon is famous for all the wrong reasons. Ever since the Tower of Babel in Genesis, where proud humanity shook their fists at God, sought to rule the world themselves, Babylon has been infamous for sin and idolatry and violence and oppression. Babylon took God's people into exile. 
Babylonian culture is notorious for its pride and its arrogance, its idolatry. Babylon, in verse 8, has this global corrupting influence on all the nations, making them drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Babylon, the empire, had fallen hundreds of years ago, but Babylonian pride, Babylonian culture, Babylonian idolatry, it persisted. It always rears its head, wearing different clothes, perhaps, but at its heart, the same thing, proud, arrogant humanity raging against God. Rome, with its emperor worship and immorality, was like Babylon. London, with its secularism and immorality, is like Babylon. The gospel of God announces the fall of Babylon. All Babylon's fall. All beastly, tyrannical empires and powers, they all fall. All ideologies that sideline God, they all fall. They are defeated. They are overthrown. This is God's gospel. He will reign. The third angel continues, verse 9. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, for for anyone who receives the mark of its name. The overthrow of Babylon is complete, as the beast's worshippers experience the wrath of God. And it's a strong image, isn't it? The wine of God's fury poured full strength into the cup of God's wrath. What are we to make of this? It's another Old Testament picture, the cup of God's wrath. Uh, We know about that, don't we? Because Jesus talks about drinking the cup of God's wrath on our behalf in the Gospels. So these unrepentant nations who worship the beast, they drink their own cup. Not a literal cup, just a picture, but a picture that communicates very strongly that God is wrathful and that those who worship the beast will experience that wrath. Now we must hear this very clearly. God is not neutral and uninterested in the proud tyrannical kingdoms of the world, the empires, the regimes that push him aside, nor is he neutral or detached about those who join with them in pushing him aside. He is not neutral about those who ascribe glory to them and not to him. He is the king. He is, verse 7, the one who made the heavens and the earth. He is the one in whom we all have life. And so he is not disinterested or distracted as his name is profaned. He is not dispassionate or impotent as people deny he exists or make him in their own image. When Roman emperors styled themselves and their ancestors as gods, he was angry. When leaders today exercise tyrannical, godlike power, he is angry when aggressive secularism denies God, when people refashion God in their own image so they can shake him off, he is angry. His anger is not petty or vindictive. He is patient and long-suffering. His anger does not negate his love. His rule is not tyrannical. He's not like the beastly empires of the world. His rule is good. It's life-giving. It's freedom. God loves the world, he loves you, and he loves me, yet he is angry at sin. When we come across an image like the wine of the wrath of God and we find it difficult, could it be that we underplay the seriousness of sin? So the gospel message, fear God and give him glory, worship him. It's right that God is worshipped. Something's gone very wrong uh, when God is not worshipped, something has gone awry. 
there's a fundamental problem when the world, and each one of us plays our part, dethrones God. I often hear uh, sin talked about like this. I wonder if you've heard this before. Uh, It's a tragedy uh, that we cut ourselves off from God. He is the source of life and all that is good, and so judgment for sin uh, is about getting what we've chosen. Uh, We've chosen to cut ourselves off, so the judgment of hell is that separation from all that is good forever. That's true, but it's not the whole picture. Sin cuts us off from God, yes, but it is also an offense against God. He is angry because of sin. So sinners will be separated from God as Savior, but sinners will also experience his wrath. The Lamb is there, present in verse 10. The judgment on the beast's worshippers is the final part of the gospel message. The hour of his judgment has come, verse 7, and so just as the, the angel announces Babylon's fall, so the next angel announces the judgment on her allies and her worshippers. So the lamb strikes back. The lamb's army bracing for battle. The gospel is proclaimed. The gospel of God's victory and Babylon's defeat. And thirdly and finally, the earth is harvested. Verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested." Verse 13 is an astonishing verse, isn't it? Blessed are those. Blessed are those. Sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. And those blessings are surprising. But this one, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Why can it say that? Blessed are the dead in the Lord from now on. How can he say that? Because Jesus' victory has transformed death. By defeating Satan and his beasts, by defeating Babylon and her allies, Jesus has transformed death. Death is still a horrible enemy, a miserable experience. It's a miserable experience, isn't it, when a loved one dies? But to die in the Lord is a blessing because his kingdom is coming. His rule will be established, his everlasting kingdom, where there is no death, no suffering, no sorrow, no tears. This is the future for those who die in the Lord. And this is true finally because of the two harvests, uh, the grain harvest that we've just read and the grape harvest which comes later. The grain harvest, it's a picture of salvation, a picture of gathering in. That's what you do at the harvest, you gather in. Back in Verse 4, we saw that these 144,000, they were first fruits, purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. First fruits is the beginning of the harvest. The first fruits tell you that a big harvest is on the way, a huge crop is going to be gathered in. So the Lamb's army, those first worshippers who followed Jesus to death, well, they were just the beginning. But a huge harvest is coming. The whole earth is harvested, verses 14 to 16. The people of God are gathered in, worshippers from across the whole world. So from one perspective, we might see Christians in the world today being killed for their faith or experiencing hostility or persecution. Maybe in our own part of the world, we see Uh, Christians being subtly tempted to compromise and being mocked and shunned for their faith. And it looks like the beast is winning. Looks like he's grinding down the church. But from another perspective, worshippers are being gathered in 
to the kingdom of God. As Christians are martyred, that is what's happening. As Christians die, that is what is happening. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. But also, as the eternal gospel is proclaimed and people respond with faith, people are being gathered in to God's people. The harvest is taking place. Jesus is fighting back in the worship war. Jesus uses the image of a harvester in the same way, doesn't he? In John's gospel, when he sees a a crowd of Samaritans coming towards him, he turns to his disciples and says, look, the fields are white for harvest. Worshippers are ready to be gathered in as the gospel goes out, as the victory of Jesus is announced, as the fall of Babylon is proclaimed, worshippers are gathered in. God is gathering in a global harvest of worshippers. There's a second harvest, the grape harvest. This is another Old Testament image from Joel. Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full, and the vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. The grape harvest, it's a picture of the final gathering up and judgment of all human wickedness. So the earth is harvested, worshippers are gathered in, and all of Babylon's wickedness is destroyed. These two harvests, they are two outcomes. As the gospel is proclaimed, as the army tells the truth about God, both outcomes mean victory for the Lord God and the Lamb. Either the nations are gathered in to worship and give glory to God, or as allies of the beast, they are thrown down so that God can reign. Either way, the result is victory. And this is how the war is won. And what's left at the end is universal worship of the one true God. Look at the words that the crowd sing in chapter 15, verse 4. They say, Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. The nations come and are brought in as the Lamb's army does its work, as the gospel is proclaimed. So it might feel uh, like defeat to stand firm for the gospel. It might feel like we're putting ourselves in harm's way or making life difficult for ourselves. It might feel like the beast will overpower us might feel more sensible to compromise with them, even if we think, keep our fingers crossed. But Jesus wants us to live victoriously. And the beasts are defeated as the truth overcomes the lie. Victory comes on earth as in heaven as people give glory to the name of the Lord, now and into eternity. The song is an extraordinary song, isn't it? It's like the song Israel sang when they were rescued from Egypt. They sing, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. May that be our song now and into eternity. It's a song of victory. Patient endurance is still required. It will be tough to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Tough to tell the truth under pressure. But when we do, that is victory over Satan. The Christian who tells the truth about God is living victoriously. The truth of God overcomes Satan's lie on our lips when we testify that Jesus is Lord and worship him. When you testify to Jesus Christ, you are fighting as a soldier in the Lamb's army. You are conquering Satan's lie. So the stakes are high. Uh, Your life may feel mundane or unspectacular, but in fact, in fact you are, before a watching world, a soldier in the Lamb's army. You are able to live victoriously, overthrowing Satan's great lie, testifying that Jesus is Lord. There is ultimately great encouragement in this passage. God wins. The victory in heaven becomes victory on earth. Satan's defeat is total. And this victory is carried out and broadcast as 
the Lamb's army tell the truth as the gospel is proclaimed. So how is the war won? The Lamb's army braced for battle, the gospel is proclaimed, and the judgment harvest comes. So let's patiently, faithfully testify. Let's pray as we close. Thank you, Father, for this extraordinary book that paints in such vivid colours for us how your great victory will come on the earth. And we pray that you would help us to patiently, faithfully endure, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and to tell the truth about him. In Jesus' name, amen.